All right. Um, well, I will admit to you, I'm still just a wee bit rattled from that worship. Um, kind of dislodged my brain. <laughs> Which would be fine, except you actually need your brain to preach. Uh, you, a little bit. You want the spirit primarily, but, but he tends to need to access the brain and then the mouth. And, uh, and so if you'll give me just a moment, I'm going to get my wits about me again. Um, you know, I, um, I guess in a way we're all people of our time, aren't we? And, um, you know, I, um, I struggled a long time with the calling of God on my life, and I don't know if any of you f have felt that same thing. Uh, sometimes it's a real wrestling match, you know, and, and some people can get through it in a matter of weeks and months, and others, uh, like me, it takes decades. And <laughs> I have finally settled the issue. Uh, that I have the privilege in this time to preach the Word, to teach the Word. Uh, and, and, and so I look around and I think about, well, my goodness, what a time. This, yeah, isn't that the truth? It's a time when the truth is being let go of by so many in the church, uh, almost wholesale levels. And, and, and I'm just going to tell you, that bothers me. There's something about that. It bothers me when we see um, high-profile leaders fall one after the other, or we discover even worse, we discover that their lives were a sham. Uh, that, I don't know about you, that bothers me. That, that, that hurts. It hurts more than it embarrasses me, if, if that makes sense, and and so I live with that awareness, you know, it's like, and now we've got YouTube. And now the, the heart of man who really, I mean, the truth is Alan talked about it today. I mean, uh, we all have that Nephilim in us, right? We all have that part of us in us that has so, somehow co-conspired co, co with the enemy or he's, He's, I don't know. It, in other words, we have itching ears because we want God to tell us what we want God to tell us. Because the reality of us as humans is we actually, the human part of us does not want to change. The born again spirit part of us craves change. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But one of the scriptures that I go to um, as a warning to myself over and over again, I mean, I do this, I don't know, maybe once a month, I'll just go and read because I realize that one day as one who has a calling and stepped into that role, I'm going to actually give an account before the Lord. Um, I go to 1 Corinthians 3 a lot, and it says, If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will uh, become obvious. Uh, for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has Built, survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss. But he himself, praise God, will be saved, but only as through fire. Uh, so I'm, I think about that as, a, as one who preaches and teaches. I think about that a lot. I've, I've, I spend a lot of my time preparing and then preaching uh, publicly and then one-on-one -on -one with people and um, and when I think back, I wonder about those first two decades, how much hay and stubble and wood I'm responsible for. Now, I am so grateful for the mercy and grace of God because we done dealt with that. I said, well, Lord, I don't even want to know I've told, I, don't, I don't even want to know. Let's just, you cleanse that 
and let's make a deal from this point forward with your, by your grace, it's going to be gold, silver, and, and priceless stones. Amen? But see, we got to understand that principle is not just for preachers. It's for all of us. We are all building with gold, silver, or precious stones, or we're building with wood, hay, or stubble. Obviously, a lot of times it's a mixture of all of the above. We're all doing that all the time. Um, so the question is, how can we, who have a tendency to be drawn to wood, hay, and stubble, that human part of us is drawn, hey, listen, I'm drawn to donuts. <laughs> you understand? I haven't, had a, I haven't had a Krispy Kreme donut for two years since the last time the angel of the Lord brought them to new life. <laughs> But every time I drive to Hickory and drive by that, uh, the, that Krispy Kreme place, Kelly and I are together and I say, do you feel the devil right now? Hot and ready? If the sign goes up, I'm probably sunk. But I'm drawn to donuts, you know? I'm drawn to wood, hay, and stubble. And that part, there's a part of you that's drawn to wood, hay, and stubble too, Right? And how does somebody, I, I mean, I know people, you know people, who have experienced the most glorious things, the things we're dreaming of and praying for exploding right now amongst us. I know people who have lived in that and walked away from the Lord. How does that happen? Well, I want to circle back and read the verse right before the passage that I just read, Paul wrote this, according to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder and another builds on it. But listen, but each one is to be careful how he builds for no other, for, for no one can lay any other foundation. Somebody say any other foundation then what has been laid down, that foundation is Jesus Christ. See, here's the dilemma. There are good men and women who started out well, were running well, and something took hold of them, and their life ended up a disaster even though they had built massive works for God. And there are believers who started out well and it and it was and 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 their life and their family and all of that but they ended up crashing and burning because somewhere down the road they lost their tethering to the foundation. The foundation isn't sexy. You got, see, you got to understand that. The foundation is not sexy. The foundation is not glittery. The, the foundation is not exciting. The foundation will not sell a million books in 2022. But the foundation is what's required to keep us tethered. The foundation is what enables us to handle the glory of the Lord. So what I want to do today, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to actually try to move through this. Um, I, I will tell you, that my goal today is to give you something that you will then be responsible to go deal with. It's not glittery. 
See, I've been thinking about this, and what I realized is on the night he was betrayed when Jesus took bread and he broke it, and he took the cup, and he said, this, you know, this is my blood. When he, in, when he instrumented, what, what's the word, instituted, what we call communion or the Lord's Supper, he was actually giving us something that we could use in a very practical, real way to anchor ourselves to the foundation. Something that was actually physical but spiritual that would enable us not to get lost in the flood of revival, of, of God bless, God's blessing, or of the challenges of life. So I want to talk to you about communion. I'm taking advantage of that glorious, wonderful song we've been singing together. And I want to draw our attention to this. Um, I never have known this. Is all of that together called a verse or what is it? It's a chorus. Thank you. Thank you. I will not remember that and I'll ask it again. So I want to draw our attention to this chorus. We remember the sacrifice of love. We remember the blood poured out for us. We remember the only Son of God upon the cross. We remember the price you had to pay. We remember the wounds that made a way. We remember the Lamb for all was slain upon the cross. Now listen to me. If you'll take those six statements... And you will bury them in your heart and in your mind. If you will take those statements and you will go to the scriptures and you will undergird them with the truth of the word of God, if you will plant it like a stake in your heart, and if you will cause your mind to be renewed by it, Whatever comes, whether it's wonderfully good or terribly hard, your anchor will hold. So I want to talk about, I hope to do four of these, but maybe a miracle. We'll move quickly. You're going to have a lot of homework to do after today. We remember the sacrifice of love. We're going to take a moment and look at that in Scripture. But here's the thing, if you will then take the scripture home with you and spend time before the Lord in communion with the Lord, take the bread, Kelly and I use soda crackers, it's legal. <laughs> at, at first, I'm so legalistic, at first I scraped the salt off the top, but then I thought, well, that's kind of ridiculous. I don't even bother with that anymore. I just break up the soda crackers, the zest does work just fine. And get you a little grape juice. I buy those six packs of wee little ones like that, and uh, that way it doesn't go bad on me before we're done. And start going to the Lord with this, these things, these statements, and, and take the scriptures and get them in your minds and get them in your hearts. Your anchor's gonna hold. Because good things and bad things can pull you away. Most people don't realize the good things are the most dangerous of all. We remember the blood poured out for us. We, now you notice I skipped down there and jumped just because I, I want to handle that one first and then come back up to the one above it. We remember the wounds that made a way. We remember the price you had to pay. So let's go through this. If you promise to do your homework, I promise to move quickly. Some of you are just hungry enough to lie right now. <laughs> All right, let's move on. We remember the sacrifice of love. I mean, for me, there's no place to go except for that wonderful verse that we memorized as children. John 3.16. For God uh, loved the world in this way. And I really like the CSB's version of this because it's actually pretty literal to the Greek. In the Greek, it actually starts with a Greek word that is rendered either so or thus. 
And usually it's rendered thus, in this way. Uh, So I like that. For God loved the world, we can either think of it this much or in this specific way, he gave his one and only son. So that, let's circle that, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So let's start there. Let's not forget the fact that he paid this enormous price. There was a sacrifice of love that made it possible. Now, one of the, in that same chapter, there's a verse that we don't look at very much and you, you don't talk about much. Uh, 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 verse 36, uh, John is com- making a commentary. He says, he, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, reflecting back to John 3, 16. But notice what it goes on to say, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God, what? It does what? Come on, help me. I think we need to pay attention to that just for a moment once again. Now, Paul expounds that just a little bit, expands it just a little bit, uh, but it's the same thing. He's saying the same thing in, in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, when he says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the, son, in the disobedient or the sons of disobedience. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and were by uh, nature what? Children under wrath, as the others were also. Now, I want to give you a picture. I want to give you a picture that kind of can bury itself into your consciousness. Uh, Because remember, what we're talking about is this glorious thing the Lord has given us. We call it the Lord's Supper or communion, but it is a physical, spiritual way of bringing ourselves back to the anchor of Jesus. And uh, that's actually ivy from my backyard. I went out and cut it. It's beautiful, isn't it? Thank you, thank you. In the eye of the beholder, I suppose. But you know something about that beautiful ivy? I mean, I took that picture like 90 seconds after I cut it off and brought it up, laid it down, and I cut it. Do you know what? 90 seconds after it was cut off, that ivy's dead. It's dead. It's actually dead, already dead. It's cut off from its life source. Now, one of the things we need to remember when we go to the communion table, uh, we got to remind ourselves over and over, before I had the privilege of going to this table, I was dead. I was cut off from the life of God. We need to remember that. You know, it's funny. I brought that ivy with me today. I just, I threw it away. It's kind of a minor version of the wrath, I guess, (laughs) of that which is the ultimate destination of something that's dead. It has no use, right? And so, um, and it's really interesting. um, These leaves are still, you know, they're kind of, It's starting to show its death a little bit. Maybe I'll keep it for a while and just watch it shrivel (laughs) and remind myself that would be me. That would be me were it not for the sacrifice of love. That would be, say, that would be me. Now, I want to move on then, secondly. Remember, go back and do your homework. Uh, We remember the blood poured out for us. Now, I want to take a minute, and Jesus addresses this blood, of course, in what we call the Last Supper. Uh, And uh, we have four kind of 
perspectives of it uh, in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then Paul in 1 Corinthians. So let's take a quick look at them. Uh, in Matthew it says, For this is my blood of the covenant, the blood being poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Uh, in Luke it says, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, the blood being poured out for you. Uh, and in Mark chapter 14, 24, it says, this is my blood of the covenant, the blood being poured out for many. And then finally, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, uh, this cup is the new covenant. I love that. This cup is the new covenant um, in my blood. Be doing this as often as you do. Uh, for my remembrance. Now, what I've learned over the years is um, uh, we're getting glimpses, we're getting parts, and you can sometimes assemble all of the parts and get the whole of what happened that night. And probably something like this happened. Jesus took the cup and he said, for this is my blood of the new covenant, being poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins, and then he looked at those guys and said, being poured out for you. And then, be doing this as often as you, as you drink it in remembrance of me. But the thing that's common to all of those is what? The covenant. See, I want to call us back some years ago. I think this was pre-COVID. Isn't that funny? Now it's like you remember your life. It used to be I remember my life pre-marriage, post-marriage. Pre-children, post-children being in the home. Now it's pre-COVID, COVID, sort of post-COVID. I think this was pre-COVID that I did a series on this passage. Uh, out of Hebrews. Listen, for the people of God who want to be anchored in the truth, for the people of God who want to anchor themselves to such a degree that wonderfully glorious things and really bad things, nothing will pull you away. We got to keep going back to this over and over again. Because the Lord went to a lot of trouble in Jeremiah and a couple of times in, in Hebrews to tell us this stuff. I will put my laws into their mind. This is the covenant. This is the covenant. I'm going I'm to give you an arrow. I want to draw your attention to four things. I love the fact that it's not complicated. The Lord says, this is the covenant I'm going to make. I will put my law into their minds and write them on their hearts. That's big. Because the last covenant uh, came out of print on stone tablets. <laughs> you understand? That'd be cumbersome drag that around. But what, he's making a covenant. Dan, he's making a covenant. He's committing himself. And by the way, do you know what the blood actually did? I think it's the Holman Christian Standard Version. It's not literal, but it is darn right exactly what's being communicated. It says, by the blood, he, I will ratify the covenant. By the blood that I shed, I'm going to sign the document. Right now, it's already been put out there. This is going to happen. The agreement's been made. But when the blood is shed, when the signature goes to it, it's irrevocable. From that moment forward, I am going to do a different thing with people on the earth who will respond to me. I will take my law. I will take my promises. I will take all of the things I want communicated and responded to, and I will put them in the human mind of those who are willing, and I will write them upon the heart of those who will yield. That's powerful. That is good news. Listen, it took Kelly and I about 10 days to respond from Finney's passing because that was devastating. Now, we're still healing from it. 
But for 10 days, we, I just couldn't bring myself to sit with her and do communion and pray for her healing. But aren't you glad we're held by grace? Aren't you, aren't you glad God doesn't just say, well, bump you? But he holds us by grace and lets us get through the woolly parts. And so now we're back again. And one of the things I pray, because I recognize there are promises in the word of God. And we'll look at, we'll look at that. But listen, those promises have got to be put in our minds in a supernatural way. My thinking wrestles against God. My thinking is at war with the ways of God. My thinking will negate faith that actually comes out of my spirit if, it ha if my mind hasn't been renewed. So one of the things we do every night is I pray the, we pray those prayers and those promises together. And, and when we take the cup, I remind the Lord and I remind us of this right here. We need you to take these promises and put them in our minds. We need to think like you think so that we're not resisting you. And then we need you to write them on our hearts because I know that's where faith comes from. There was a time I tried to grunt faith and lay it like a chicken lays an egg, but it doesn't work. I don't guess the chicken grunts, but you try to lay an egg, you will. <laughs> there was a time I thought I got to do something. Well, there is something I got to do. I got to say, God, I am putting your word before me, but there's something I cannot do. I can memorize it, but I cannot supernaturally imprint my mind with it. Only you can do that. And only you can write it on my heart and cause faith that moves mountains to spring forth. But you have made a covenant through the blood. Now, as Brother Furtick once said, this may take a while. John Wimber was once asked why people didn't get healed. And he says, well, there are some things that we will never understand, and we'll put those over here. But the vast majority of time that believers don't get healed is this. They quit too soon. What happened? They quit before the word was imprinted upon their minds in a supernatural way, and their hearts have been impregnated with faith that moves mountains. Now, think about this. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's massive. That is massive. We can now call on him as our God, but even bigger than that, we are his people we are his people. I love that. I love this part, this promise. Because they will all know me from the least to the greatest them. What a privilege, the covenant. What a privilege that I can know God. Alan experienced that, I guess, yesterday morning when he had that wonderful encounter with the Lord. Thinking, I am talking to God. Well, you know what? You and I can talk to God. Listen to me. He has made a covenant through the blood of Jesus. It is irrevocable. It's been ratified. It's in force. And it's waiting on those who will step up and say, I'll take hold of that, God. I'll take hold of knowing you. I'll take hold. I'm the least, but I'm going to take hold of knowing you like the greatest. Can somebody say hallelujah? hallelujah? And it's all undergirded by this last promise that Jesus alluded to on the night he was betrayed. For, because, the other three are anchored on this last one. 
This is the, this is the somebody say the daddy rabbit. <laughs> This is the daddy rabbit of all covenant promises. When God says, because of this blood, because of the covenant I am ratifying through this blood, I will forgive their wrongdoing and I will never again remember their sins. Good gracious saints. Come on, somebody. I tell you, there's this thing that if, if, if you're struggling with sin, you need to avoid communion because it'll kill you. Oh, I got a word for you today. If you're struggling with sin, you need communion. Yes. Amen. I call that being an honest struggler. You need to go to the throne and say, God, I'm taking this bread and I'm taking this juice. I'm coming before you because I need to know one more time that yesterday's failures, heck, 30 minutes ago's failure is, is, is forgivable. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. Oh, gosh, I tell you, I didn't mean to get carried away with that, but it blows my mind. I'm telling you, can you excuse me? I'm illegally out in the audience again. This have not happened in months, and I do repent. Um, but it appears to me that the light's working just fine, so I'm wondering. Isn't that wonderful? See, if you get hold of that, when you fail, you will get up quickly. If you don't own that promise, when you fail... You will wallow around in the mud for 30 days, letting the devil beat you with condemnation. But when you come to understand that it was never about your performance anyhow, that it is the blood of Jesus that has ratified this covenant, it's the power of God and his grace that's going to get you through, you will fail and then get up and repent and move forward quickly. Somebody say, this is a good covenant. But can you imagine that we get un untethered from this promise, from this core? Man, we remember the blood of Jesus poured out for us. I'm going to try to move quickly here. We remember the wounds that made a way. Listen, this, this is like the greatest opportunity on the planet to go after people's emotions, and I do not want to do that at all. I want to be factual. I want us to think about something. On the cross, Jesus suffered wounds in two facets. Sorry, I'm getting older, and that strutting and preaching is, <laughs> takes more out of me than it used to. <laughs> That's for young men to do. <laughs> Old men should pull up a chair and sit there and talk. <laughs> On the cross, his hands were pierced. His feet were pierced. And then to make sure he was dead, his side was pierced. Those are legit wounds. But I don't believe those are the wounds necessarily that this is talking about. Let's take a look. He was beaten and slapped by the temple guards, number one. Number two, Roman soldiers then mercilessly flogged him. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. Number three, they twisted together a crown of thorns and pressed it into a head. Listen, we all know this was not like the thorns that, that are on the blackberry bushes around here. These were needles. These were needles. And they didn't just... Gently lay this crown. You've got, you got to understand, they pressed it into his head. Then they bowed before him in mock homage, homage and slapped his face. I can imagine that happened one after another. They just kind of had him up there as a spectacle. And then one after other, these uh, demonized soldiers went up bowed before him and then got up and slapped him in the face. And then they hit him on the head with a stick and spit on him. These are the wounds. 
Remember the wounds, wounds that made a way. Now, what are we talking about? We're talking about let's stop drifting through communion and let's use it as a weapon of war. But let's go back to this flogging because that's the daddy rap. <coughs> Mel Gibson, I, 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 I think he probably nailed it as well as anybody has. And I, am, I, gave, I did not give away the temptation of putting that picture back up here. But you've got to understand, this flogging, there would have been two soldiers, one on each side. Jesus would have been strapped down either like this to a stone pillar or standing up with his hand strapped like this to a stone pillar and he would have been completely naked. Buck naked, as we say around here. No clothes. No holy loincloth. Because the flogging was meant as much to humiliate, do you hear me? As it was to inflict physical pain. And then two soldiers, one on this side and one on this side, would take these instruments of torture, which is exactly what they were, because each one of them would have at least three leather prongs, if I can call them that, with either bone and or lead into it. And it was designed, it was engineered to cut into the flesh. Oh, you've got to believe it. And the reason is the blood loss. That's the problem. They beat him over and over and over again. And literally the blood. Have you ever wondered why he didn't have the strength to carry his cross? There you go. The miracle is he survived it. You understand? Now... Rick Rayner is a wonderful Bible teacher. I listened to a video he did on this, um, and, and I just went back and just wrote out what he said. So this is his video. Um, uh, I think it's called The Scourging of Jesus or Scourging of Jesus, whatever. Jesus' body is literally torn open. His muscles, his sinews, his flesh, all of it is shredded by the scourge that has been laid across his body by two torturers who simultaneously strike him from both sides. Now, let me make an observation. This was not necessary for your salvation. The cross would have been sufficient. Salvation was purchased on the cross. This is to fulfill completely Isaiah 53. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses. Now let me make an observation. The, Greek, the, the Hebrew word there, and I taught on this sometime back, the Hebrew word there is sicknesses. Somebody say it's sicknesses. You know where he says in uh, uh, Exodus 15, 26, for I am uh, Yahweh who heals you. It's that word. He himself bore our sicknesses. We've got to allow that to penetrate our minds and our hearts. And he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck bound by God and afflicted. Wouldn't you have thought that? If you observed this uh, prophet being beat like that, how would God ever allow such a thing if he really was of God? But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities, punishment for our peace, our shalom. was on him and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep and we all have turned our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Listen, here's the deal. I don't understand any more than the rest of you how the gears work with healing. Why it takes place this time and it doesn't take 
place this time. There are a lot of things we could uh, explore on that. Sometimes, no doubt, it's lack of faith. Sometimes it's this or that. But let me make one thing perfectly clear. Jesus paid for healing of spirit, soul, and body. Let's not lower that bar. Don't let your disappointment lower the bar. Jesus paid the price so that humanity can receive uh, healing from Yahweh who is our healer. And he's going to do that today for some people, I think, I believe, I hope. Could be deliverance from some horrible bondage you've been in forever. It could be a physical healing. But he's here today and he's reaching for you. The price has been paid. Listen, the price has been paid. We remember the wounds that made a way. Karen, if you guys want to come up. I'd, I'll be honest with you. If Brian hadn't had that dream, I would have, uh, I would have whispered in Alan's ear, just tell him to keep on worshiping. But I know the Lord wants to do something today. You know, repentance, in the simplest way of saying it, in our language, is a change of mind. Repentance is, I did think this way, but I'm changing that, and now I think this way. See, I think what's going to happen, what's already happening, if you will allow it and you will respond, is the Lord is taking some misunderstanding, some misconception, some disappointment, some laid down theology, and he is dealing with you directly, heart to heart, spirit to spirit. And calling for a response to say, you know what, Lord? I am going to change how I've been thinking about that. I repent. This one. You remember I moved it in order because I wanted to finish with this. It's legal. It wasn't scripture. It's a song. It's a good song, but it's a song. Remember, what I'm trying to teach you today, what I'm trying to equip you with is the, as your pastor, uh, if you will allow me that privilege, even if you're visiting today just for a few minutes, what I'm trying to do is equip you with a weapon of war. I'm trying to equip you with something that will anchor you to Jesus no matter what comes. So that when we take that bread and that cup, we remember the sacrifice of love and we remember the blood and we remember what the blood did. And then we remember the wounds and we know that everything's been paid for. And up to this point, that's pretty much a one-sided deal if you're human. And I think if we understand those things, then we're set up really well to remember the price that he had to pay. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 6, you are not your own for you were bought at a price, so glorify God with your body. So listen, listen, saints, this is what I'm calling on us to do. I'm calling on us, whether it's publicly together or whether it's at home individually or as a family, every time we take the cup, every time we take the bread, I'm calling on us to remember in that moment, I no longer belong to me. This body no longer belongs to me. Everything has been given over to the one who paid the price for me. Say this with me, I am one who has been bought at a great price. See, that's what Peter was saying when he said, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living uh, as strangers, for you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life. I love this. Uh, uh, Inherited from your ancestors. Anybody, Anybody say, that's me? 
Anybody's ancestor live an empty way of life and you inherited it? Not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with precious things, with the precious blood of Christ. Man, come on, somebody. See, I tell you, you know, I was talking, I, you know, I get really sad about uh, big name ministry people who go off the rails and destroy the faith of many. That makes me really sad. But it also makes me really sad when I see the people of God who has been bought as a great price living as if nothing ever happened. There's no discernible dif difference outwardly from the unsaved neighbor. Can somebody say something's wrong with that picture? Now I want to finish with a passage that you'll not see an immediate connection, but I think it has everything to do with it. And here's the thing I want us to see. You can either hear this as some kind of legal legalistic command or we can embrace what Jesus did on the cross. We can, we can embrace the body and blood of Jesus in such a way and it so powerfully penetrate our hearts that it is nothing but our greatest joy to go out and try our best to live for Him in a way that honors Him. Can you hear what I'm saying? I'm not saying get, somebody, get a stick after you and make you behave. That's, that's, if, if that's the attitude, then you've missed it completely. The love of Christ, the love Christ had for us, the love of God, it, that's what compels us. That's what motivates us. That's the rocket fuel in us. And if you don't have that rocket fuel, if you don't have that gas, then my, my plea to you is, are you born again? Hear me. Are you born again? I think that's where we'll stop. promise you if you're visiting we usually don't go this long it's not an apology that's an explanation <laughs> I just want to close by saying this I know that I know that some people are here today or are watching online. You came in here or you tuned in one way. And the Word of God has been like a double-edged sword thrust into your being. I invite you in whatever way the Lord is calling you to do it, to respond. Because as one who has walked with the Lord for over 40 years now, I recognize that is the grace of God. And if I'll step into the grace of God, it, it consumes me. If I push back and resist the grace of God, it will be a memory that will fade with no change over time. So let's stand. And let's just take a moment and let the Lord do what He wants to do. We have prayer benches available to you if you want to come and do business with the Lord. Some have already done business with the Lord earlier today and it's beautiful to watch we have an altar if you want to come and do business with the Lord there we're going to have prayer pods with people available if you want someone to look you in the eye and pray with you and for you that is available if you are here today and you need to be baptized listen if you've been born again I have a word for, for you you need to be baptized 
first command given to the New Testament church in many ways. Be baptized. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can make that happen today. We have everything you need for that to happen today. N knowing the group that we're with, I suspect there's probably some who are here today and you need to respond and say, I need Jesus as my Savior. The greater majority are going to be those who say, I got to make this right. Whatever he's doing, I invite you to do it with him.